In just a few seconds, this car will hit that concrete wall. And when it does, the front end will crush like a soda can. There will be an explosive chemical reaction, and the occupants will continue moving forward. It looks like absolute chaos, but it's all by design. This is a car crash. This is damage control. If you've ever been in a car crash, you know it's instantaneous. Impact can take as little as 24 milliseconds. That's faster than we can blink. To slow things down, we went to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety to crash some cars. The test you're going to see today is our frontal small overlap test on the driver's side. In all of our high-speed crash tests, we're testing three different things in cars. One is the structure of cars, the second is the airbags and restraint systems, and the third is the injury measures that we get from the dummies. When we develop a new crash test, we are continually looking at the real-world data. Um, we're looking at fatality databases, we're looking at in-depth uh, in -depth crash investigation studies to look at how people are being injured and killed, the types of crashes, and understanding that really helps us fill the gaps of where we need to go next to push safety further. What we learned is that every crash has three collisions. One, car hits barrier. Two, body hits car. Three, organs hit body. The ultimate safety design goal of any car is to manage the first two in order to minimize the third. To keep the passengers safe, cars do a counterintuitive thing. They make the crash last as long as possible. A crash happens when you go from some speed to zero in a very short amount of time. You don't want the occupants to experience that deceleration from 40 to zero in you know, a very short time. You're not able to, to use your brakes to slow down effectively. If you can spread out the, the deceleration over that time, then you have a good chance of surviving. The first level is making sure that the vehicle, say if you're hitting a rigid wall, doesn't stop right away. So you want that vehicle to absorb some energy and come to a controlled stop. One technique for improving protection in these kinds of crashes is to disperse energy across the front end of the vehicle where people aren't sitting. But then you want a strong structure around the occupants of the car. We don't want any energy being dispersed in there and structures being pushed back towards the people inside. When you look at crashes of older cars, you see the results of their more rigid construction. Uncontrolled chaos. Rigid objects transfer kinetic energy effectively, make a car too rigid, and the passengers will take on more of the force from the crash. To counterbalance the parts that must be rigid, engineers find places that can yield without harming the passengers. You do have very controlled points in the front end structure that will collapse, and usually in a very predictable way in certain types of crashes to help absorb some of that energy, and that's what we call crumple zones. If you have a situation where that occupant is slowed down too quickly, you can have severe uh, injuries to the skeletal system, the bones, and the soft tissues, the, the brain inside the skull, and the abdomen, and the chest. Really, during the crash, you have the vehicle deforming, the occupant moving forward, and then finally, when the occupant stops. A lot of what we see mainly these days depends on a lot of times we see orthopedic injuries depending on the scope of the accident or a solid organ injury like your liver, kidney, spleen, or where we have combinations related to the location of the injury where you might have a bad fracture like the bones around your hips that also injure the bladder and or the rectum or the colon or small intestines. And it depends on really the speed. At this moment, the car is decelerating violently, but you're not part of the car. 
and physics wants your body to keep moving forward. So the new challenge is to manage the second collision to slow your body down, way down. This is where seat belts and airbags come into play. Car crash safety is kind of like packaging 101. When you're shipping a fragile object, how would you ship it? The first thing you want to have is a strong structure around the object. The second thing is you want to have cushioning materials, things like airbags and seat belts that keep the object from bouncing around within that strong box. And the third is you, the object inside of the car. No matter what car you're riding in, the seat belt is the number one thing you can do to protect yourself in a crash. Seat belts are central in restraining you, further slowing you down while simultaneously extending the duration of the crash. So, today's seat belts are actually designed to give just a bit with the body during forward movement. The load limiter is a mechanical device that just senses too much loading by your body and lets out a little slack, and then when it senses a little more loading, it lets out a little more slack. If that occupant decelerates too quickly, um, you're going to have some issues, right? Because um, either the occupant hits the steering wheel or the seat belt in a manner that is, is too hard too fast, and so you want to make sure the airbags and the seatbelts control some of that slowdown to make sure you mitigate the potential for injury. The last line of defense in a car crash, the airbags, are a lot more complex than meets the eye. They are triggered by a chemical explosion and expand outward faster than the blink of an eye. They're not just the big pillowy thing that inflate and stay inflated. They have vent holes and as the occupant moves forward into them, it absorbs energy, it vents some of the gas out so that you're not just hitting a very hard, rigid structure. And this brings us to the third and final collision. Even though your body is slowing down, your organs are still traveling forward. Even though cars are becoming safer and safer, our body has still traveling and the physics behind these things are very susceptible to these internal injuries. A lot of it depends on the mechanism and the forces of basically the physics of it and also the location of where the passenger is. Once we get into higher speed accidents, we see a lot of combination of solid organ injuries and brain injuries um, of what we call kind of the polytrauma patient. And it involves more than just an isolated injury to an extremity or one organ at a time. The best way to lessen this impact and potential for serious harm is to use design to harness the uncontrollable. Rather than designing an unbreakable car, have it crumple. Better than lock the body in place, let it move. If people walk away from a crash unharmed, it's because a combination of things have occurred. Number one, the vehicle did its job in terms of structure. It kept a strong structure around the person. The restraint systems did their job in protecting the person from hitting things inside the car. And the person was probably wearing their seatbelt. No matter the speed, once a car crashes, the sole engineering goal is to decelerate the body and save your life. It's never gentle, but the longer it lasts, the safer you are. Cars do this by employing a complex system of controlled self-destruction. Self-destruction that hopefully keeps you alive.